Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, uh, whatever you did to celebrate. Ours was very low-key, but really nice. I, of course, ate too much, always. And I had a glass of wine with dinner, which is... uh, I'm such a lightweight. I haven't had a glass of wine since July? No, August. I think it was August. And before that, I hadn't had a glass of wine in like almost two years. So it's not that I don't drink. I just drink so rarely that I'm such a lightweight. And between the tryptophan and the glass of wine, I just wanted to curl up in a ball and go to sleep. But I wasn't at my own house. And so I couldn't just curl up on the couch and and go to sleep. Uh, I had to wait till I got home. But I mean, it was a really, really nice day, and we had a good time. Uh, My husband and I went to some friends of ours that we spend pretty much every Thanksgiving with, and uh, it was her mom and stepdad who were there as well. So just six of us, but um, really fun, some great conversations, a lot of laughs, and good food. Not much more you can ask for, I don't think. Plus, we we spoke with both both sets of our parents and some of our family before we went over to dinner, and so, yeah good day. I hope yours was as well. Um, Another author interview for you today. I'm speaking with Marcy Maxfield about her new novel, her debut novel. It's called M's Awful Good Fortune. It talks about a woman who travels a lot. She and her husband travel a lot for his job. They move a lot for his job internationally. And um, let me let me give you the description from the back. This is not your typical story about an American abroad. Instead, Marcy Maxfield takes readers on a deep dive into a woman's struggle between the desire for companionship and the demand for independence. M's Awful Good Fortune explores the expatriate lifestyle through the lens of a marriage coming apart at the seams, while at the same time tracing the lasting impact of sexual assault. As M's story weaves back and forth, both in time and between cities and countries, she finds herself stuck in a hole of loneliness, infidelity, and loss. But she doesn't stay there forever. An empowering, darkly humorous journey around the globe that ultimately arrives at a new understanding of conflict, compromise, and the complexity of relationships. That is the description of M's awful good fortune. Uh, I love the... um, alliteration of that last sentence conflict compromise and the complexity of relationships i love i love alliteration i love threes so works out nicely uh, i love the title and all all the different takes that you could make uh, of that you know m's awful good fortune is it just that she has awfully good fortune or is it awful and sometimes good fortune well you're gonna have to read it to find out or listen to this interview to find out There is a lot of humor in this story, but it's not easy. It's not an easy story. As as you heard from the description, there's there's a there's struggles with this marriage as this couple tries to, you know, figure out what it means that they are traveling for the husband's job, and what is M the main character? What what does that mean for her as as a wife, as a mother, as a woman? They do have two children, and so they're um, they're taking their children when they move, and that le- that adds levels of complexity to any situation. And then again, deciding to move for one person's job at one point, M says that you know she used to make more money than her husband, and now she is having trouble finding her place. She does volunteer work. She does a lot of things to try and um, fit in with the new community wherever they live, but that's not always easy. And I know for myself, it takes me a very long time to transition into a new place. 
at least six months. I'm not the type of person that can just jump in and be like, hey, everyone, you're my new best friend. <laughs> it takes me a long time. And so, you know, there's there's just so many layers to moving and to marriage and family and uh relationships and this book is nothing like the last book that I spoke to the author about uh, Summer Club when I spoke with Catherine Dean Mazeroff on the last episode but both women both authors both books talk about that hybrid um hybrid the hybrid lives that a lot of women lead and what does it mean that you're a wife and a mother and uh, a woman and all of those other relationships, how are you balancing whether you're a stay-at-home wife and mom, whether you are out in the workforce, whether you're doing a combination of both. Both of those books and those authors talked about the struggles of those relationships and those finding the balance between all of those disparate pieces of a person. So, um, and as we all know, someone's going to judge us regardless. If if we stay home, there will be judgment. If we work full time and the kids are in daycare, there will be judgment. If we try to find that balance, maybe working part time, raising kids part time, not part time, it's a full time, but you know what I mean, working part time, and as well as, as raising the kids, someone's going to judge. There's always the judgment. But um, enough of my soapbox let's go ahead and turn to the uh to the interview again the book is m's awful good fortune the author is marcy maxfield hi marcy welcome to the podcast Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Thank you for being here. And we are here to talk about your novel, M's Awful Good Fortune. But before we do that, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Oh, sure. Uh, so um, I am a late bloomer writer. and uh, But I think I always wanted to be a writer. And I was always writing and journaling and noodling. But it isn't until fairly recently that I've begun publishing this book. And prior to this book, I had an award-winning play at the Hollywood Fringe Festival. And uh, in terms of a broader uh, introduction of who I am uh, and as it relates to the book, um, I have lived, I call myself a serial expat. I have lived in all of the countries that are in the book, which is, China, Korea, Japan, France. I've also lived in Spain and um, I'm based in California. And most of, most, most of the moving around has been attached to my husband's career. So I am what's called a tag along wife. And uh, that's kind of a debate. It's a term that, that people use sort of, um, sarcastically, but it does mean that I have been attached to my husband's career on a lot of these moves. And uh, in the book, I, I think I say it makes me feel like a, um, oh no, I, I, I talk about the other term, which is trailing spouse, which makes me feel like a turtle with a shell on its back. But at any rate, there's a whole bunch of us out there who move around um, as expats. Yeah. And um, actually, you you mentioned both Tagalon wife and trailing spouse on the first page of the novel. And um, uh, triggers is too strong of a word, but I saw that phrase trailing spouse. And I I find that phrase a little problematic in a lot of ways, but, you know, it's accurate. (laughs) So accurate and it is problematic. Nobody really likes to be called either of those things. But um, Actually, the most common term is trailing spouse. I almost never use it. I use the word tag along wife. And then I like to put it in perspective and mention that I consider Michelle Obama to be the ultimate queen of tag along wives because she had this brilliant career as a lawyer in Chicago. And she ultimately had to quit her job and move to DC because her husband had an even bigger mission. So um, tag along, it's, it's a term that is much broader than just this, the, the specific use I was using it as being an expat wife, mm-hmm. because I wanted people to begin to look at all the different ways in which we sometimes um, are tagging along on somebody else's 
steam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So can you give a a bit of an overview of the story itself? Sure. Uh, So um, M's Awful Good Fortune is loosely or broadly based on my experience living in the countries that I've mentioned. And um, the, but the book, the heart of the book is really about the, is really about the themes of marriage and compromise and how you navigate uh, dual careers in a marriage and marriages that experience uh, certain kinds of uh, friction and also infidelity and um, how you ma- how you how you navigate these issues and sustain a marriage or whether or not you should sustain a marriage. So anyway, I think M's Awful Good Fortune is about being an expat living all over the world. Yeah, with some pretty heavy um, topics thrown in there, just, you know, for good measure. (laughs) um... (laughs) Well, it's funny because I started out writing a memoir and uh, I, I do typically write from my own personal experience. So I thought, oh, I'll write it. A, a memoir and a lot of the inspiration oddly came from um, the politics in our country and how um, I wanted to turn away from, I wanted to turn off the news and do, and do something more creative and more um, sustaining for myself and something so that at the end of this, at the end of, uh, I thought, of course, we thought there wasn't going to be an end of the Trump administration, but at the end of it, I would have something creative to show for it more than just uh, pink pussy hats. Cause I had been very involved. I had gone to Washington DC and marched with the million women's march or whatever it was, the women's march, and, uh, the women's march on DC. So um, I was very involved in all of that. And then I decided instead to really focus on my writing and do something creative. But all of that, I think really started to influence the book I was writing because I could no longer just write a simple book about, oh, I've lived in, in Paris and I've lived in Korea. And I began to really look at the, um, the impact of my husband's career on my life and and connect it to what's going on with um, a resurgence of the of patriarchal forces in our country and women losing ground and rights. And so it all started to come, come swirling together. So my idea of writing a memoir uh, about living overseas as an expat turned into a much more feminist political statement. Well, and it's it's political from the perspective that um, M mentions throughout the book, seeing being an expat and then seeing this country from, you know, an outsider's perspective, right. because you start seeing, you know, you're not immersed in it. And so you see it from other people's perspective. I would imagine that you've had that similar experience in your time living abroad. It's fascinating to live abroad and see the United States from that point of view. For one thing, for example, we lived, uh, we were living in Paris during the whole, during the Clinton administration, when there was a big brouhaha about, about, um, about Bill Clinton having uh, extramarital affairs. And the French were laughing at us because of course, at that time, I think it was Mitterrand was, I mean, he was just very publicly involved in in an extramarital long-term relationship. And and it's just, um, they, 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 the French thought we were very provincial. More interesting maybe is, that I was also living there during um, 9-11. And so I actually experienced 9-11 outside of the country, uh, watching the news in in French, which I didn't particularly understand, but I was getting the gist of it. And then being with a group of international women from who were, anywhere from being uh, French, Scottish, English, Australian, whatever. And the, and the entire, um, and the sense that uh, what, how America proceeded, how the United States proceeded after that event was not well received uh, in Europe and around the world. So 
And that was also an interesting time to be overseas. I think that I don't write about a lot of that. I don't write about the specific politics, but you, you do get to see your own country um, from a different perspective. And certainly from a more personal perspective, I've had to, I've dealt with healthcare ish incidents in, in a lot of different countries. And I can just tell you, it's a lot easier to, to uh, get in and get out and no bill. <laughs> like, really? Like, like you're not going to charge me for the x-rings? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard I, lots, lots of stories from different countries about the, you know, and what it actually costs when you leave. Yeah. 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 When, when they actually decide to send you a bill. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, I know once I was flying from uh, Paris to Corsica and I thought I had sprained or, or some, done something to my arms so and landed in Corsica and we went to a hospital and, and, uh, they just saw me. I, I'm not even, they just saw me immediately. I think I was in within five minutes. They took an x-ray. They said everything was fine. Gave me some, you know, some pills or whatever. And no bill just sent me on my way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's, that's a little counterintuitive when, you, when you're used to a certain system. <laughs> Um, I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't want to America bash, but it just, it's one of the, it is one of the benefits of living overseas. And I think everybody in our country really should have to spend some time in a different country, uh, a sort of like mandatory Peace Corps thing, because it is a big world and some things we do right and some things we don't do right. And it would be nice to share uh, knowledge and experience and resources. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, everyone does things differently and there's pros and cons to any country that you move to. All right. Now that you know a little bit more about Marcy and M's awful good fortune, let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about the main character, M, and what about her might, com might, my readers might find compelling. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or any where you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Marcy Maxfield about her debut novel, M's Awful Good Fortune. Let's return to that interview. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, oh, excuse me, can you talk a little bit more about M, Emma, the main character, um, and what about her might resonate with readers? Sure. So, um... M. So, so I, so at some point I moved from writing um, what I thought was a memoir. I was never actually using my own name. I was always using the character's name of M. So I guess I was never really writing a memoir. Um, but I, I like to say that she's uh, that she photobombed my book because once I was freed from really what what my experiences were and able to see them through M's eyes. She just took over and really the book is, is, is all hers. It's all her voice. It's a voice driven book. It's a thematically driven book and it is not a plot driven book. It's nonlinear. And it's really about being in the mind of this woman who is a hybrid. She's a mother, a wife, a professional, uh, also a professional volunteer, uh, because she has to give up her job so often, but she's, uh, she's committed, she's angry, uh, she's badass, but sometimes she gets walked all over. So she's a very complicated character, and I think women will be able to appreciate this because I feel like so many of us are, um, 
are leading these hybrid lives where we're raising our children, we're working our, our, our careers, we're trying to keep our, we're, we're involved in our marriages, we're involved in our communities, and we're doing so many different things. And uh, so I feel like women will, will understand where this character is coming from, what her frustrations are, what her angers are, why she sometimes um, fights back and why she sometimes just lays down. And uh, so she's a, I, I, th I think I made a list, I made a list of um, adjectives that I have been on reviews for her and it really makes me happy. So here, here we go. She's funny, brutal, ferocious, hilarious, cool, sarcastic, biting, raw, human, relatable, blunt, sassy, angry. She's really um, a mix of all of these different things that I think so many women really are, because we're not one dimensional, we're not two dimensional, and we're living really, diet, we're really, we're complicated lives. And I think that the um, the idea that most that most women today work outside of the home, um, and what we haven't really na navigated as so well is how to ma manage dual careers. Whose career uh, gets who, whose career takes um, front seat when um, or what happens to somebody's career when somebody else's career impacts it which is again, the, the Michelle Obama, the concept that M Michelle Obama had this booming career that she really had to scrap to follow uh, Barack to the White House and then had to remake herself. And so I'll, essentially that is what I had to do. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think at one point, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, M says something about, uh, she was the one that was making more money at one point in the relationship, oh. but then you know she's the one that becomes the trailing spouse. Absolutely. Uh, I think that when we're, when uh, this is based in my, it, my own experiences that when uh, my husband and I were younger, the time when he first started uh, traveling, it's because he couldn't get jobs. We lived in Los Angeles and he couldn't get jobs in Los Angeles, that his skill set was more employable uh, overseas. And he wasn't necessarily making more money than I was but uh, he needed to be employed. And um, he's certainly making more money than me now. <laughs> <laughs> right. But then, you know, what do you, what do you do when that's the case? Do you say, cool, honey, go have your job overseas. I'll be here when you get back. <laughs> or do you yeah, back well, up and, and go with? Right. And I think that I, I think the, the, the journey of Emma is that she tries everything. She says, okay, cool, go overseas. Um, I'm going to stay here and keep my job because I really like it. And, and her marriage practically falls apart. And that's, I think, when infidelity and first enters into the marriage. So the next time um, she goes, okay, I'll come. I'll quit my job and I'll come with you because I want to keep my marriage together and you're the father of my children. And then she's... Uh, depressed. And so I think by the time she, you get to the third post with M, she begins, she discovers writing and writing becomes this thing that, that she does that makes her whole, that fills the holes that, that uh, have been left in her, her life uh, by following her husband's career. And, but from my point of view is me when I look back on the whole experience, I realized that I was also, I was equally part of the, the problem in that I had an inability to redefine myself and to really just say, oh, okay, I'll follow you, but I will become a writer. And I was still hanging on to this other concept of myself as a as a career woman, and it wasn't working. The dual careers in, in a situation where one person's international and one isn't, what, wasn't working. And if I, as I look back on it, I think, oh, why didn't I have a light bulb and become more flexible? But that wouldn't have made a good novel anyway. So I really dug in, I dug my heels. And, I, and the character uh, is, a, it's a probably a good time to introduce the concept of autofiction, which is um, 
the idea that a, that a piece of writing is grounded in authentic reality, but, but highly embellished. So I, I get confused when I talk about the character M versus me, Marcy, but I, the way, the best way for me to describe this is that uh, she's 10% of my thought process blown up into 100% of a, of a character. She's very authentic for that reason, but she is not me. Um, so that's why I can say, I look back on it in my own life and think, damn girl, why didn't you just, why weren't you flexible? (laughs) Well, hindsight is always lovely and helpful, but, uh, in terms of, you know, you started writing a memoir, but, um, the character of M existed. Was that because your first name is Marcy that starts with an M? Is there, is that coincidence or just, or part of your Oh no, I, I. I started writing and I never, for, I never wanted to use my name and I don't know why, but it was, that was just a, um, organic decision. So yeah, it is, it, it is because my first name is Marcy because the, um, the, there's a, because M E M backwards is me. So there's a little code in there. Uh, but she's not, she is a character that is a part of me, but, but she's not me. My marriage is not really the same marriage that was in the book. Um, but it was a lot of fun to write because she's, she's, um, because she's kind of says whatever she wants to say and, um, doesn't hold back. And you mentioned earlier the, you know, the nonlinear nature of the book. Did you start out to write it kind of in that nonlinear way or did that develop as you wrote? Um, my writing process is typically nonlinear because, uh, and the, because, because I don't sit down with a possibly because I, I'm not writing a pure work of fiction where I'm making a story up. So um, I'm doing an exploration of um, on a theme. So what I'll do is I'll just sort of brainstorm all the things that I want to talk about and I write about them as they come up. So I don't write linear, I don't write linearly, but addition, additionally, um, I didn't want this to be the story of my life. Um, I wanted this to be, a work of fiction. So I didn't want it to say, and then we moved to, <laughs> so, cause it wasn't about that. There are a lot of books out there about the expat experience, which is, um, and first we lived here and then we moved there. And then we, and, and, and so I thought, Oh, I was going to cut and paste anyway. Makes sense. Uh, there's a chapter in the book called I am not a geisha. And in, in the copy of the book I received, there's a card uh, with artwork on it and uh, a quote from that chapter. So I, all of that tells me this is important. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that chapter and the artwork and the card, um, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. Geisha. Well, I, th- I love this, this scene about geisha because um, first of all, there's this, this idea that uh, a tag long life kind of wife is kind of like a geisha, although she isn't, but it's sort of um, a woman who doesn't have full agency. And uh, so when this piece of art comes up, uh, M is bidding on it at a, at a, uh, at an auction at a nonprofit in overseas nonprofit auction. And she's bidding against a guy who's essentially very like her husband. She's essentially, you know, a fat cat expat man with a wallet in his pocket. And she's like, Oh no, you're, you're, you're not going to win this battle. So I think it's a a great, um, just a, a, a pivotal scene where she just, goes toe to toe with this person and says no. And she has her own money from a previous job. And so she's like, no, I'm buying it. I'm buying it with my own money. And no matter how high you go, I'm going to be right there bidding against you. So I I just think it's one of the times when she just uh, claims her own, her own agency and fights back. In some ways, it's a bit of a microcosm of some of the bigger themes in the book as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just, it's a little, it's a a metaphor of the bigger issue of what's going on in her own marriage. And so uh, she stands up and says, I'm not a geisha. 
All right, time for the second break of the podcast. When we come back, I will give you a content trigger warning that we are going to be talking um, a little bit about the sexual assault that happens in the book. Uh, so if you want to just skip that first part of the of the interview when we come back, that that is your prerogative, but I want to let you know that it's coming up. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with author Marcy Maxfield about her book, M's Awful Good Fortune. Let's go ahead and return to that interview. And just as a reminder, uh, this, this section does contain a conversation about sexual assault. So just a trigger warning. Some of the other um, tougher themes throughout the book are, um, you know, the, the impact on a marriage of of being expats of of being a trailing spice it's space spouse etc but also um the uh the impact of sexual assault and can you talk about it's such an important topic but also i can imagine very difficult to write about so can you you talk about the the inclusion of that topic within the novel yeah it, at some point and then this was one of the last pieces that i wrote pieces of the puzzle. And at some point, um, people were saying, well, why didn't she just leave him? <laughs> why didn't she just live alone? And so I had to sit with that. I, I was like, well, I don't know. I thought I've already explained that. I thought, I thought, you know, she wanted to keep her family together. She was, she wanted her to, she loved her husband, wanted to be with the father of her kids. But I woke up one morning and I, and this story, uh, this scene that you're talking about uh, of a sexual assault just came and it just wrote itself. And I looked at it and I thought, well, this doesn't have anything to do with my book. Why did I write that? This <laughs> and then I sat with it and I thought, oh, what is the impact of sexual assault? The lingering, lasting impact on women. Um, it's subconscious. It's the idea that you can't, that you might not be safe living alone, that it's, it, that it's dangerous out there. And, and um, so I really included it for that reason. And I guess it was my subconscious talking to me about, uh, because I wouldn't ever sit down with you and tell you that consciously I was thinking, well, I didn't leave my husband because I was a survivor of sexual assault. Uh, but that's not how sexual assault and P P PTSD works. And um, it's, and I wanted to come at it, include it in this book, but not make it a book about this issue. I think it's a really important issue, but I didn't want the, often it's just when it's in a book, it's the main topic. It's a book about rape or a book about sexual assault. But I think that the numbers are so enormous than the, the, the um, survivors of sexual assault in this country. There are so many that it's, it's just almost commonplace. And how is that Im impacting women as they walk in the world? And how is it holding them back? And how is it um, holding them back from li living their strongest, fullest, most, most powerful lives? 
So I think, like I say, that sexual assault is a, is um, it's akin to in the character. The character in this book has a limp, which she turns into a swagger. It's just that's from a childhood accident, and so I sort of tie it into that, which is the idea that it's 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 a it's something that you carry with you from an a, you know a childhood accident that that um, impacts how you move in the world. I think it also makes sense in terms of um, you know the question. Well, why didn't she just leave her husband? I think so often women get that question for so many things. Well, why didn't you just? <laughs> Um, right. you know, why didn't you just report it? Why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you just do X, Y, and Z? And it's never that simple. No. And that's why I, um, I, the first line of the book is sometimes I wish you would hit me and not that I would ever let anyone hit me upside the head. And that's been controversial. And some people have wanted me to take that out, but, um, that's the thing. If somebody is in our country and in our society, if somebody is hitting you, there's just no question about it. Everybody says, of course, you have to get out of this situation. But if somebody is just um, overpowering you or uh, diminishing your po career potential, it's not a reason to leave someone. I think that uh, I think that had I had, had an had had an opportunity to redo some of those things, I would do them differently. And I, on the other hand, I'm really fortunate because um, I held my marriage together and was able to uh, become the person I always wanted to be. And it wasn't as if my husband is abusive. It was as if he was like so many men in this country, just. Uh, in a default to the patriarchy position. And it was surprising to me because I'm a very strong woman to have, and he's not a particularly, um, you know, bullish kind of guy. It was just this default to the, it's a default to the patriarchy that still exists. And so I, I really was trying to challenge women to start thinking about how, how, this is impacting them in their lives also. In terms of character development, some of this is obviously, you know, autobiographical in ways, but also fiction. So in terms of character development, did you have a pretty good idea of characters as you started or did some of the, the characters, those characters develop as you wrote? How did that process work for you? Uh, okay, so... Um, The, the M character, like I said, she just wrote upon the book. She just sort of took over. And once she started to take over, I just let her have full reign of her voice. I didn't start out with a concept about that character development. That was just a gift from, from the gods. Thank you. Um, from uh, the, the husband character, uh, G, uh, I, I just... As I said, I think that um, he was as much channeling all of the the um, talking heads on the on the right wing world of politics. Who who was just uh, it, it was just he was a very political character, not necessarily my husband. Um, and I give my husband a lot of credit for being so supportive of my book, but he's actually, my husband is a theater major. And so he was like, yeah, you need an antagonist. I'll be it. So I went, Oh, good. So um, in terms of character development, um, most of the situations uh, ha were situations that happened, but not necessarily as they happened or with the people. So I think that for example, Andra, the character, the best friend character is really um, a composite of all the best friends I've ever had along the way. So I didn't sit, I don't sit and do a character study because so much of it is based in, um, in authentic experience, if that's your question. Yeah, yeah that, that's great, yeah. thank you. Um, are you working on anything new now? 
I am working on something new and it is not with the character M, even though I think I might bring M back because she's so much fun and people have really, really responded so well to her. But I am working on something that is um, also about, I, I, about uh, women and I, but more about identity uh, and we'll see how that goes. You'll have to stay tuned. I think that's the, the best thing any author can say at this point in a writing process. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely. Are, um, are there any other of your other writings? This is your debut novel, but you've, you've done, you've, you've written. So are there any other of your, excuse me, are there any other writings you would like to highlight? No, because I mean, I, I would, uh, no, not really, because my play is not really available. I did have uh, the play called Girls Together Always, and that was 10, uh, ten um, monologues about growing up female in, in America. And so I guess these are my, these are, this is the kind of, um, this is the milieu that I write in. I write women's stories. I typically write first person, but then uh, I don't stick to the truth because I, I want it to be uh, more, um, I'm, I'm into the craft also of allowing voices to run free. So uh, I'm not really writing memoir, but I, I am writing auto fiction. My publisher said auto fiction doesn't exist, but I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's just like women are hybrids right now between all the different things, the balls that they're juggling, that also writing right now is in this amazing point where there's so much hybrid writing going on. And I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with all of the labels. Uh, because when I say, if I say it's memoir, people would say, but it didn't really happen like that. And you created a character. And if I say that it's fiction, people go, but isn't it based on your life? And so I'm like, yeah, I'm a hybrid. I'm a hybrid writer because I will always be writing a, from personal experience, but I, I'm very involved or very concerned with craft as well. And um, not that memoirists aren't concerned with craft, but I will always go, I will always push the writing um, and lose and lose the truth if I think it'll make a better scene. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's changing in the world of publishing and publicity nowadays, but um, it, it's been so genre focused for so long that the fact that people are writing cross genres now, across genres, it's hard for traditional maybe publishers or publicists to, you know, there's not a specific box <laughs> to put. There's not a box. And it's interesting because my publisher went, at the beginning, when I first started talking, working with them, and this was pre-COVID, uh, was like, well, auto fiction doesn't exist because when you walk into a bookstore, there is no shelf for auto fiction. And I now I want, you know, I'd love to have that conversation with her today because I'm like, well, when was the last time anyone walked into a bookstore? <laughs> I mean, I love bookstores, but our lives are completely different. Our 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 habit, our shopping habits are completely different, certainly with in the in the book world. And and so the idea that that the category for my book is based on a brick and mortar store is um, I think a little uh, behind the times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things just, it takes a while for things to like that to catch up. And time for our third and final break of the podcast. When we come back, Marcy will be sharing a little bit more about her journey to becoming a published author. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and I will be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. 
Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Marcy Maxfield. Right. You mentioned that you uh, were a late bloomer writer. <laughs> Can you talk about the process then that, that made you start writing and then also start writing for pub- a publication? Right. Um, okay, so um, I, I think in college I wanted to write. And, but it was just, I wanted to write. I wasn't doing, I was journaling. I, I was journaling. Then I was writing poetry. Then I thought I, I worked early on. I worked in the music industry and I was writing song lyrics and, and stuff like that, but I never really took it seriously. And my business career definitely took off. And I, I, for some reason, I just thought artists know that they're artists and And, um, you know, it's one of those things, if you could go back to your young self and go, you do know what you are, but I didn't have the, I didn't, I didn't have the self-confidence and I didn't start seriously writing till I was living in Paris. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with myself for four years in Paris? And I took a writing class and I was published in Paris rather quickly. Uh, Several of my pieces were published in a literary journal called Upstairs at Dirac. And so I had that moment of, you know, small, but community, community success. And though, um, and then I became uh, a co-editor on, on this magazine. And uh, I had to read other people's works and pick them. And I, so as you've gathered, I have a very honest, just a very uh, raw, honest, uh, voice on the page, a strong voice. It's been actually called an andro- androgynous voice. And uh, it's a voice that I think men and women equally appreciate. And so I picked work that was, I, as, a, as this co-editor, I picked work that was more like mine. And um, the other editor was like, that's not that's not real writing. And that's, and I just always had the sense at the very beginning that I wasn't still wasn't really a writer and that my work was perceived as, I don't know, like I used to think of myself as being a, a, um, a hammer in a China shop that I, a sledgehammer that my voice was like a sledgehammer. And what I didn't understand that that was my gift. My voice is kind of like a sledgehammer and now I'm owning it, but it took a long time for me to begin to share my work with people. So I've been writing for years. It wasn't until till, um, my play at the Fringe that I ever allowed my work to be to leave my computer. And it was really well received and I won an award for it. And I was like, wow, okay, well, I'll just keep doing this. <laughs> but I, I think a lot of it is just um, a lack of self-confidence and um, a long journey to owning my own strength and power in terms of being a writer and, and being comfortable with my voice, not necessarily being like anyone else's voice in my style, not necessarily being like anyone else's style either. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe instead of a sledgehammer, your voice is more like um, Thor's hammer. You're a, you're a superhero. I'm a superhero. There, thank you for turning that into something. Yeah, <laughs> for years I just thought, oh, I lack finesse, and because that's that's kind of what I would, you know, it was a very very arty environment, and um, very poetry arty. And I love poetry, poetry, and I actually write poetry now. But I, I just had this sense that my voice didn't wasn't refined, and it's not refined. That's really the best part of my voice. <laughs> so. It took a while to own my own voice. If I I can say anything to anyone out there, just own your own voice. Because right now um, is a great time to be breaking molds and uh, doing your own thing. 
actually, that's the perfect segue into my follow-up question of, you know, do you have advice for aspiring authors? And I would assume that'd be a big part of it. Yeah, that is part of it. Yeah, don't. Okay, here's my advice. Just write. Uh, just write and don't even know what it's okay if you don't know to what end just keep writing and also read writers need to read Uh, and I know you're probably going to come up and ask me who I'm reading but um, which is I, I think that you can't live in a vacuum where you only write you need to read you need to get inspired you need to be a, a good ally to other writers and um, and don't give up you are correct. That is my next question. <laughs> Who are your go-to authors and genres when you do read for yourself? Yeah. Um, okay. So for the longest, longest time as a, as a young woman, Joan Didion was, just did it for me. And I'm not going to back off of that because she's amazing. And, um, but the, the, the literary muse for M's awful good fortune is, and is, it was, uh, Juno Diaz and his book, This Is How You Loser, was just dog eared on my desk. And whenever my writing went flat, I would uh, get a step away from the computer and get out a pencil and get out my notebook and just start free writing until, well, first I would read some, sorry, whenever it went flat, I would read some pages of his work and I would go, okay, you can do this, you can do this. And then I would sit and I would free write. So I'm a huge fan of Juno Diaz. Um, his, his, he blurred my book, which kind of made my life. Um, his work is astonishing. His it's just alive and vibrant, and it mixes language and it's street and it's high highbrow at the same time. It's everything. So uh, I'm I, my two JDs, Joan Didion and Juno Diaz. But lately, I've been reading a lot of women writers because I'm a woman writer, and uh, so I'm into. Lydia Yuknovich, who wrote The Chronology of Water, which is being made into a movie. And I think it's, I can announce that my, my book has been optioned for a, a mini series, although they still have to like attach talent and get a production company, but still right. that's pretty exciting. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, and I'd love to see Em on the screen. And I'm also reading, uh, I'm just listening a few things that are that I've been reading this year. This year I read Trust Exercise by Susan Choi, which is a brilliant, a brilliant book. Um, I love it's a book that halfway through in the middle of the book completely just turns the book upside down. I love when something surprises you like that. It was just crazy and good. And I'm also at my in you know on my bed stand is poser. By Claire Dieter, which is a memoir. Um, uh, and the structure is 23, I think, 23 yoga poses. And then every chapter is a different yoga pose that she learns, but also how it relates to what she's, how she's learning and growing in life. And what I really like about this book is that it, that it um, it's completely um, like you're just talking to a friend. She, Claire Dieter has this way of just being so uh, almost like not oblivious to the fact that she's writing and other people are going to read it. It's just so um, honest and authentic and ha- not stylized. I think my work is highly stylized and I, her work is just really, um, it's just really from, from her point of view. And uh, also what's really cool about this book is that uh, you can read it in increments like, oh, I, you know, 23, 23 yoga poses. You don't have to like you can read about a yoga pose and stop. So it's a great book to have on your beds, bedside table. Those are my books. Well, thank you. Uh, in terms of your Internet presence, uh, if you could share your website and any social media where people might be able to find you. Sure. I have a, my website is my name, marcymaxfield.com. And uh, I'm also, I have an author's page on Facebook and uh, it's probably Marcy. It's, it's, it's not actually, it's, 
I have to look that one. You, anyway, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm sort of on Twitter. Uh, it's hard to keep up with all of it, don't you find? <laughs> and uh, but I, if you if you go to my website, you will find me in all of those places. Yes, it's definitely hard to keep up, especially because they keep not they, you know, whoever they are, but <laughs> uh, new social media keeps getting added to the to the list. right news. <laughs> right, exactly. New social media keeps getting added, and and um, I. I'm like, okay, but I, at some point I actually have to write. Right. So anyway, I'm on, I'm on all those places and uh, you can find me there. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a highly accessible person. I have my, my real life email out there in case people want to do book clubs. I've been doing a lot of book clubs uh, and I find that it's, it's a lot of fun for me and it, and uh, because everybody's living on Zoom anyway, that uh, I, it's easy for me to attend people's book clubs. So if anyone wants to uh, contact me about appearing, making an appearance at a book club, happy to do it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, in terms of our conversation today, we've, we've talked about a lot of different uh, topics, but is there anything that you would like to highlight that we haven't covered so far? Gosh, I don't think so. I think that we've, I think that we've covered it. Uh, yeah. I All think right. what I wanted to add was the whole book club thing. Yeah. Perfect. Well, um, thank you so much then for taking the time to talk to me about writing, especially about writing M's awful good fortune. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me to come on, Sarah. Thank you again to Marcy for joining me to talk about M's awful good fortune and being a trailing spouse and everything else that we talked about here. She made a joke after we were done recording about um, this is why she doesn't write linear books and is that she just doesn't think linearly. And I think that's great. I love how people's brains work and uh, we don't all think in linear patterns. Some of us do, some of us don't. And so hearing different voices and different different ways that uh, we process things I just love and find fascinating. So thank you to Marcy. And before I wrap this episode up, I, I wanted to say that this book is incredibly well timed for me personally. I wanted to leave this till the end of the episode because I didn't want to take away from Marcy's interview or anything to do with the book. But um, I'm always fascinated how even though interviews get set up months in advance often they can be the timing of interviews or or different authors is is amazing to me sometimes so uh, I am actually my husband and I are moving to Portugal in February it sounds so weird when I say it out loud I my circumstances aren't exactly like M's or Marcy's but uh, we are moving to Portugal I will in a sense be a trailing spouse although not in as much of a sense as as M in the book but yeah it was just interesting to read about M's experiences and uh, hear about Marcy's experiences and then know that I am moving to a new country and I'm excited but I am terrified beyond belief you have no idea um I have not traveled a lot in my life and so moving to and I've moved a lot I have not lived in the same place for more than three years since I went to college and so I think that has been I don't know 27 moves the last time I counted the uh, counting little tiny moves between you know just the, but I've not lived in the same place for more than three years actually um coming up on December 1st will mark three years in this current house that we are in and so I'll get three years in about two months before we move another time but um yeah so I haven't traveled much really I've lived in I, I keep backing up and, and restarting my sentence but I've lived in Montana I've lived in Texas I've lived in California and then and Pennsylvania back to Montana back to California I've lived in several states obviously but um, moving to a different continent is a huge undertaking and we are in the process of getting visas and downsizing the house and just wow yeah 
Um, I just say that because not to say, hey, look at me, but more because this book was so well timed <laughs> for me personally that it was it was just uh, really interesting that the, the timing was what it was. So thank you to Marcy for writing the book and also for just, you know, happen happening to be on the podcast at such a, a timely a timely time, an opportune time. I appreciate your conversation. And I appreciate you, my listeners, of course, as always. If you are a fan of this podcast, please do me the honor of leaving a review that can be written or starred. Either one helps if you you know, don't, it doesn't even have to be a long review. It can be a one sentence review, but uh, leaving a review is a huge boost to the podcast. Also, if you are not doing so already, follow on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Lately, I've been most um, active on TikTok, but uh, uh, active on the other three as well. So would love to hear your thoughts, love to hear what you're reading, and just love to hear from readers. So hit me up on social media. I hope you will join me for the next episode when I'll have a returning author on the podcast. Brenda, Brenda Marie Smith will be joining me to talk about the second book in uh, her series. And that the book, this book is called If the Light Escapes. And she joined me the first time to talk about the first book in this series. So join me for that. I'm really looking forward to having Brenda back on the podcast. In the meantime, hope you're having a fabulous weekend. Hope you are getting lots of naps to sleep off that tryptophan. And when you're not napping, I hope that you have plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.